Mosaics of the Messiah. The book of Zechariah in our Old Testament is just a small little book. It falls within the Minor Prophets. It's one of the last books of the Old Testament ever written. It doesn't have a lot of contributions to, towards the growing nature of Old Testament theology. But Zechariah packs a punch. It is full of so much material, drawing on other parts of the Old Testament, that it actually stands as a, a crucial hinge point between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Per square inch, there's a whole lot of New Testament quotations of Zechariah when compared to other Old Testament books. I mean, there's some whole Old Testament books that aren't quoted or alluded to really at all in the New Testament. And, and yet you have a book like Zechariah, just a short little book, and it is quoted time after time after time, alluded to, I think, time after time after time. And I think that that gives away its importance, not just during the time it was written, and not just uh, during the intertestamental period, but in the days of the early church. I think Jesus reflected frequently on the book of Zechariah. I think other Jews around his time were reflecting on the message of Zechariah. And I think the New Testament writers, as they sought to make sense of this whole Jesus uh, thing that had happened, his, his life and ministry and death and resurrection and ascension, as they're trying to put all these pieces together, they frequently went to the book of Zechariah to make sense of it. And so I think what we get in the book of Zechariah is a whole lot of material that points forward to a coming Messiah. However, it doesn't do it in this sort of traditional way that we may think of messianic prophecy, where you just have this text pointing forward to something happening in the future. Instead, I think what Zechariah will usually do is uh, Zechariah will quote or allude to some other Old Testament text. In fact, it's almost as if Zechariah is standing midstream. He's, he's catching all of, this, all of this messianic prophecy, all of this information, all of this theological tradition that has come before him. And as he's processing this and receiving his revelation from the Lord, it seems that he, he then puts that into new form. He encapsulates this message and gives new prophecies, and, and they sort of serve as this mosaic. Uh, it's not just one picture. It's a whole bunch of other pictures, a whole bunch of other portraits, all put together. And when you begin to zoom out, then you begin to see there's this portrait that's developing of this messianic figure that is to come. And so, over the next several sessions, we'll be looking at the book of Zechariah together. I'm calling this series Mosaics of the Messiah because I think that's exactly what Zechariah gives us. It's all of these texts built on all of these earlier texts pointing to all of these later texts. And my hope is, as we dig into the book of Zechariah, we'll begin to see the beauty and the glory of God, the wonder at his, his masterful plan, his masterful sovereign plan to work things out through Jesus, the Messiah. And so the first text that we're going to look at in our study is Zechariah chapter 3. In the book of Zechariah uh, chapter 3, we begin with uh, this vision of Joshua, the high priest. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now, the word there for Satan in Hebrew is actually the Hebrew word Satan. It looks just like it looks in English. And the word itself just means accuser. It's used elsewhere in the Old Testament to refer to accusers. Sometimes it refers to a spiritual being. Other times it seems to refer to human individuals. This person opposes or accuses this person, and therefore they are called the accuser. In fact, in what might feel a little bit theologically problematic for us, God sometimes is called the Satan, the accuser. But again, it's not so much all the time in the Old Testament, at least, referring to uh, this, this evil spiritual being that we know of as Satan, but rather is just a description. It's a, 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 an adjective used to describe something, the one who accuses. He is an accusing one. And so this figure that stands next to Joshua the high priest uh, is there to do just that, to accuse. And so it says, uh, verse 2, the Lord said to the Satan, the accuser, 
The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? So what seems to be happening here is that that Joshua is standing on his own and the accuser seems to handle things on on his own. There aren't necessarily intervening parties here. There's not like a defense lawyer or, or a prosecuting attorney, but rather they just seem to be standing there together. And in the midst of all of this, God speaks to this accuser. Now, verse three. Now, Joshua was, was, was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. So, what does God do? He commands that his filthy garments be removed. The angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, behold, I have taken away iniquity from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. So what's happening is, is God essentially says, I'm removing the unclean clothes from you. And I'm also removing your iniquity and sin. I'm giving you a new turban as well. And then there's this charge. If he will obey the Lord, right? Uh, if he will, uh, verse seven, thus does the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. So before we get to the branch part, I, I just, I want to address this issue with Joshua wearing new clothes and having his sin taken away. It seems that God has essentially announced that all of this is going to happen. Uh, he's going to get all of his sins removed. And now he's going to walk in obedience, it seems, to the Lord. Now, I think a few things help us understand the context here. First of all, the high priest is representative of the people. As such, he's supposed to carry the people's sins as he goes in before the Lord. And it's the high priest then who makes the way for the people to be forgiven. In fact, I think if we're going to understand this text, I, we have to look at a couple of other texts uh, that, that sort of inform what's happening here. The first one comes in Exodus chapter 28. In Exodus chapter 28, uh, you have uh, God instructing Moses about the garments of the high priest, all of the things that the high priest is supposed to do. Listen to what it says uh, in Exodus chapter 28, starting in verse 28. They will bind the breastpiece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, so that it may lay on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, so the breastpiece shall, should, shall not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron, wearing this breastpiece then, Aaron the high priest, he shall bear the names of the sons of Israel and the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. And in the breastpiece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. So this, this intercession, this bearing the judgment actually happens through the garments that he is wearing. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 2 through 10, we see the same type of thing, right? Aaron is wearing these garments on the day of atonement as he goes into the holy place. The Lord said to Moses, verse 2, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die, right? For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering, a ram for a burnt offering. He sh shall put on the holy linen coat he shall have the linen undergarment on his body. He shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. It goes on to talk about the different types of things and uh, the different types of things that he's supposed to do when he brings those offerings in. So we start with Exodus 28. It gives instructions about the, the materials that the high priest is supposed to wear. But then on Levitic, in Leviticus chapter 16, what we get are some additional details about how these, these garments are supposed to sort of help him minister before the Lord. In other words, in all of this, Aaron's garments help to signify his role and importance before the people. They also signify his cleanliness as he represents the people before God. So, coming back to Zechariah chapter 3, when we find that Zechariah's, when we find that Joshua's clothes are soiled, 
that they are not clean. It seems then it's a sort of statement of the uh, representative uh, uh, soiledness of the priesthood. They are not doing what they should be doing, and uh, the people are unable to sort of take care of their own sins and their own, own stuff. And so it seems what God is doing is he's, he's acting supernaturally. He's miraculously removing the sin and the iniquity of the people so that Joshua can stand there in new clothes. All of this then shows that he's, he's standing there with clean clothes so that he can do his effective administration over the people. Now, as it goes on in Zechariah chapter 3, it says, uh, I will bring my servant the branch. So once he's wearing these new garments, once he's been cleansed, now he's going to wear, now he's going to, to witness the bringing of this branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. So what's up with this branch and the hope that seems connected to it all throughout the Old Testament? Well, I think this branch idea comes from a reference in Isaiah chapter 4. In Isaiah chapter 4, we find the prophet Isaiah early on in his message to the people talking about all of the different destruction that is going to come on the people because of their own choices. He's just finished a section where he sort of railed against Lady Jerusalem for her wickedness. But then we get this message of hope in chapter 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole side of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy, there will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. All of this glorious new creation is going to come about because of this branch that the Lord raises up in Isaiah chapter 4. Now, this is a new day, a new time, a new hope for the people of Israel. And I think the branch then is connected to David. In fact, Isaiah says as much just a few chapters later in Isaiah chapter 11. Listen to what it says in Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the with, with, with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. So, in other words, this righteous branch will be a descendant of David. It will come from the line of David. Now, the word for branch used here in, in the book of Isaiah is a different word than we used here in Zechariah chapter 3. In Isaiah chapter 11, it's the word netzer, uh, but it is connected. This idea of a branch or, or some sort of, of, of shoot, all of this is connected to the idea that there will come a ruler from the line of David. Now, this ruler will rule by the Spirit of the Lord, a sevenfold spirit. So I think what we're seeing is within Isaiah itself, the idea of the branch is growing and developing. Jeremiah, then, I think expands this idea even more. In fact, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely, and this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. And so what we see here is Jeremiah chapter 23 as well contributing to this. So what does all this have to do with Zechariah chapter 3? Well, I think what's happening is all of these different texts are being combined in Zechariah chapter 3. 
you have the text about the garments that helps us understand what's actually happening here. This is the high priest's garments. You have these texts about the branch that give an initial understanding to what the branch is supposed to be. But then you have this Jeremiah text that seems to build on the branch of Zechariah chapter 3. So then, what does all of this have to do with the Messiah? Well, when we get to Matthew's gospel, what we find in the first couple chapters is that places play a prominent role as Matthew's trying to tell the story of Jesus, right? Uh, it seems that there's several Messianic prophecies that are being fulfilled. First of all, there's the Bethlehem prophecy, right? Uh, connected to a city, the city of Bethlehem, where the Messiah is to be born. But then Herod wants to kill baby Jesus, and so his family flees down to Egypt. And again, we were given another prophecy with Egypt playing a role. Next, we get another location as there is weeping heard in Ramah because Herod does come in and kill all of the children. So we have another location there. But then we get to the end of Matthew chapter 2, and there's a, a very strange text. Uh, it says this in Matthew 2, verses 21 and 22. So Joseph rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. So, what's going on with this text? Well, scholars aren't quite sure what text Matthew is referring to. I mean, what is this, this Nazarite text or Nazarene text? Here's what I think is happening. The Greek word Nazarene looks a lot like, or, or sounds a lot like, the word used frequently in the Old Testament for branch, which is this word, Netzer. In other words, the Netzer one, or the Nazarene one, is the one who will rule and reign. I think what Matthew is doing is he's, he's trying to point us back, not just to the Old Testament text here. He's trying to point us back to Zechariah chapter 3 in order that he might tell us who Jesus is. In other words, this is the individual who Zechariah says will wipe away the sins of the people. This is the one who will stand in the line of David. This is the one who will even function as a priest, it seems, if we take the context of Zechariah 3 seriously. And the, the Gospels seem eager to tell us all of these stories wrapped up in one. And Matthew seems especially eager to set our expectations correctly for the story that is to come. And so, Zechariah chapter 3 may seem like a strange text at first, but I think it's painting this picture for us of a coming Messiah, a coming branch, and it's a beautiful, beautiful mosaic.